There's a superpower. It's called yes and. Instead of saying the word no, like no, I don't have time. No, I don't know how to do that. By saying yes and I'll need to study X before we execute on that. The more no's you do early in your career, the worse your career goes, in my opinion. I don't think you should like ever, almost ever, tell your boss no. You should really be looking for lots of yeses in your life and then give a caveat on how to get there. Yes, I can take on that project and I'm gonna go look for an intern because it's definitely gonna take more than the 60 hours I work already, boss. Cool? Before I say yes now, I say one, is it gonna teach me something new, a skill that I need to utilize? Two, is it gonna help me earn more? Uh, three, is expand. Is it going to expand the geography that I'm able to tackle? And fourth is connect. Will this get me in a room or in contact with people that are going to better me? Learn to say more yes and, and learn to get rid of the word no early on. Need motivation? Watch a top 10 with Believe Nation. Hey, it's Evan Carmichael, and I make these videos because I need them for me, because I wanna wake up every day and watch a video that puts me in a mindset to believe in myself more and go off and accomplish amazing things and attack the day. And I hope that this video does that for you as well. So today, let's learn from one of the best, Cody Sanchez, and my take on our top 10 rules of success. Enjoy. Rule number two is learn to prioritize. All of us have willpower issues and all of us can benefit from a little eye over the shoulder. And the reason why I think we can really benefit is because I remember when I was at Goldman Sachs and they were watching us like crazy, I was never on social media. I was never dicking off because I wanted to get out of that office. I knew I was gonna have to do long hours and I wanted to get out of there when mm. I was done. I never understood the Silicon Valley foosball, make them stay here all the time Bro. thing. I'm like, come here. Give it intense, maybe do a workout break or a walk in between, come back to intense and then go live your life, you know? And if you're like me, you're gonna work way more than that, but like be here when you're gonna be here. Like right. think about work like meditation. You should be so singularly focused that all distraction sort of fades away. And if you do that, then you actually have to, you have to work less because you're so much more effective. But I remember early on in my career, you know, it's why I couldn't stay at Vanguard, actually, because I was sitting at a desk and I was trying, I was like, you know, those ducks where underneath the surface they're paddling like crazy, mm. but on top they're smooth. That was me. I was drowning. I didn't know anything about finance. I'd come from journalism. I, everybody was smarter than me. Everybody went to Harvard and Stanford, et cetera. I went to Arizona State, Harvard of the West, as you said. Um, and, uh, and, I remember one of the my teammates came up and was trying to talk to me about lunch planning and stuff, and I was like, "Cece, I, I'm focused. I don't have time to talk about any of this. I'm, I'm here, man. We could talk like after work, but like I'm here right now." And that happened like a few times, and I wasn't be, trying to be a jerk. I just couldn't be distracted because then I lost my focus entirely, and I probably have a little ADHD, and so it would derail me for like 30, 40 minutes. And I remember that happened, and then my boss, at one point, was like your team thinks that you would leave dead bodies behind you. And I was like, huh, really, why? And they're like, well, you don't pay attention when they come up to your desk, you don't do party planning. And I was like, guy, I am here to do a job. And I am going to, I would never like run over somebody to do the job, but I will be singularly focused to get it done. Rule number three is be a good listener. Listening. Listening's greater than speaking. So I have a rule called the 10X rule. And no, this isn't about doing 10X the work. This is about you focusing on giving 10X more than you receive. The biggest thing that you can gift somebody is actually listening in a conversation. The smartest, wealthiest people I know, they don't talk a lot. In fact, my friend actually had dinner with Warren Buffett. No big deal, humble brag. And Warren Buffett did one thing he said. When I asked Alex afterwards, what did Warren say to you? He said, it wasn't what Warren said to me, it was the questions that he asked. He's like, I talked 99% of the meeting with the Sage of Omaha. And the reason is, is because the guy's always letting other people talk. Because who is smarter? The one that gives everybody the answers or the one that takes all the answers by listening? You make people feel better because everybody likes to talk about themselves and simultaneously you're getting all the answers. So he sat there with Warren Buffett, getting no information and giving all of it. That's why you should always listen instead of speak. Rule number four is take risks. I think most things that are worth it take some hard work. So that's one side. So let's be real about it. And I think humans can feel real. You can feel it in your gut when you hear it. Yeah, and then on the flip side that. of that, uh, I don't like lazy. 
I like some risk. And it's actually, it's quite hard. And we could use Sam and Sean as an example. It's hard to, to be okay with a little cringe. Like to be okay saying something like no small boy mm-hmm. energy. Like people could, you know, it feels like maybe not that intelligent or not that sophisticated. And so people don't want to do the like slightly cringe thing of putting a half naked person on your, you know, pool card, right? Like it, it's some like somehow some reputational or ego risk to good marketing. And I'm sure there's like some vernacular you guys have about that, but I feel like most people go lazy and they go simple and they go copycat. And I actually say the opposite to my team. One of our core culture codes at contrarian thinking is better to be wrong than to be boring. And, and I think that's really important because you can, you can take risk and you can fail but don't fail short. Also to make sure you're actually taking action after watching this video, I've designed a special free worksheet just for this video. The worksheet will highlight all of the lessons learned in this video, as well as pull out our three favorite learnings and quotes that will inspire you to actually do something. The worksheet will also give you space to write down what your key takeaways are and your specific plan of action to make sure you're getting results. If you want the worksheet designed specifically for this video, absolutely for free, there's a link in the description below. Go click on it and start building the momentum in your life and your business. I'll see you there. Rule number five is be strategic. When I'm looking at buying a new business, I do step one is always, I typically find the operator first. I'm always starting with who's the guy or gal that's going to run this thing for me. Um, and then I'm vetting them like we talked about humans, background checks, references, past work. And after I've found that human, then I'm looking for operator and me fit. So not that's not just like culturally, how are we together? That's like, well, with the money that I have and the resources that I have and the skill sets this guy has and the resource he has, what's a good business for the two of us to do together? And then finally, I'm probably thinking, you know, what business can we buy that this person can operate that fits in that little middle of our Venn diagram? And um, and there's lots of ways to structure it. I think the most important part for you just learning is to realize that if you don't want to run the business, you have to find the human before you find the business. Most people go and try to find the business and hope that the human's in the business, or they think that they can go hire the business. And you can do all of those things. It's just hard. We've all hired before. Hiring great people is really hard. Hiring somebody else to run your business and your dream, not theirs, is also really hard. So I start with the human and then I go to the business. Then you can get to structuring. Like, you know, do we vest the equity right away? What are the cliffs? How much money do we pay them? What percentage of revenue or profit? Um, Which you can, again, slice 57 ways from Sunday. Rule number six is eliminate distractions. How much time do you spend on that analysis? I let a lot of things go by the wayside. One of the most important things I keep reminding myself is that no is an actually wonderful word. No is an incredible word to use more often. And so is the ignore button. You know, I got a lot of shit on Twitter because I posted like, leave your text messages unread. Um, I don't respond to a lot of text messages. I don't respond to a ton of emails. Um, I don't take phone calls. You can't pay me enough money. Somebody reached out with like a number that I thought was crazy to just to test, you know, test my resolve, I guess, for an hour phone call. And I was like, no, I just, I don't do it because I will get distracted too quickly. And I'm a golden retriever. I want to chase tennis balls, right? All over the place. And so um, a lot of mine is I let low level stuff fly all the time. And uh, that's one. And then two, I think I just have gotten in this process of continuously each week because I'm a writer, writing this stuff down. That's my favorite part about content is it makes it gives me like the right to do recaps and post ops because I turn it into content then. It's one of my favorite reasons for getting on the internet. So every single week when we have our investment committee and I learn something new or a deal goes bad and I'm writing the newsletter for next week or I'm writing more content for our business buying group, it's real time what's happening to me in our businesses. And I don't think I could do content and running the businesses if the two weren't intermingled at the same time. Rule number seven is find the right partnership. I think that like any partnership, partnerships are incredibly difficult. And so you would really have to find partner, partner fit. And in my situation, I have a guy, Chris, who is sort of my right hand. And he like, he couldn't want to be in front of the camera less. He just 
doesn't. He's not interested, you know? <laughs> and he it. couldn't want to come up with crazy ideas less. He actually just all, his entire job and what he likes to do is we call him the vibe killer and he loves it. He's like, nope, just like do this. Or, nope. We didn't say we were doing this. We're not doing that other shiny object. We're just right here. Nope. Cody. Nope. And so in all my career, I've always surrounded myself. I had another one called April. She was amazing. She went on to be the CEO of my last company. And so in this instance, I think it works for us, but you're right. Where I see it go wrong, Kip, and you have way more experience than this. I was actually talking to my agents at Night Media that that I work with for YouTube stuff. Mm-hmm. And they were pitching me a bunch of different ideas and stuff they were going to do with other creators. And I was like, here's your problem. Most creators suck to work with. They want to talk about whatever they want to talk about. Yes. They don't actually close product and they don't have high conversion with their audience. Their audience doesn't want to buy and they, they're not willing to do the pushing, pushing, pushing of product that you have to do if you actually want people to, to sell over time. And so I think that's your, your, your red flag. So if you're a great operator finding creators who inherently want to build a business, not build fame is really tough and, and important. Rule number eight is find your real rabbit. When you get rich and or famous, you start to get around other people that are rich and famous. Mm -hmm. What's interesting then is they can see who's real and who's not like this. And you start to crave actually the respect of people that you respect. And so I've seen it implode real fast because, you know, I have a, I have a, a friend and he's young and he's done well, made a couple, let's call it tens of millions of dollars online now but he's done it in ways that people just don't kind of want to associate with it and so it's also it's this empty thing you have to pretend to a legion of humans listening to you that you're the real deal and yet at the same time you feel you can feel it and so you know i've talked to him about it a decent amount i'm like man you've got the thing you're just chasing the wrong rabbit. And so you've got to find your actual real rabbit because you're never going to have the respect just from the likes and clicks. And you'll get it once you're around a bunch of humans who are like, oh, he's a builder. Oh, he's got interesting ideas. No, no, no. He's not a hustler because that's not really what the people that you want respect from are interested in. It's like, no, he's a he's a creator. And by that, I mean a creator of value in this world. And most people don't know to strive for that. They think that we walk around comparing our bank accounts. Like, no, no, but did you see this? I'm real. It's like, no, we, I have no idea what's in your bank. And you have no, I, I have no idea. And also, if I told you or you told me, we wouldn't, what does that mean? Nothing. You can't talk about that over a dinner table. You talk about what ideas are in your head and things are you building that are worthwhile for us to have a conversation that doesn't feel like we're at the shallow end. And at a certain point, that's where you want to go when you've had some success. Rule number nine is hire the right people. You sort of talked about having this list of operators. For those of us that are just trying to get one operator for whatever business, how does one go out and actually source an operator? Yeah, it's. I think it's your immediate network. So I call it the COI effect, which is basically you're looking for centers of influence, but you are the center of influence. So if you think about it right now, for instance, I have... Laura. Laura's my property manager and she runs the crew that cleans my house in Austin, for instance. She's awesome. So we went out of town for four weeks and we had to have all these projects done on the house. So I was like, I need the the, the fences stained. I need the patio redone. I need you to buy a couple of these plants. I need you to do this. I need you to take my car into X, Y, and Z. And I just kind of said, do all that. Charge me what you will. And it was a micro project. And at the end of the four weeks, she had done all of it. She had done everything that I wanted her to do. And she saved me a grand by not taking it to one dealership and taking it to another one. And so when she did that, um, I basically got with her afterwards and was like, well, you take 50% of what you saved me because uh, you, when you save me money, you're going to make money. Love that. And then I basically said, you're really competent at this. So what if we made you our office manager and our property manager? And so I kind of like scale them up with little little services. And then finally, like I see her being one who could manage, like she could probably manage a couple of my Airbnbs and own a uh, part of that company. And so you could think about it the most micro scale, like everybody probably has a door guy at your building who's just incredible every single time, or the guy, the valet who parks your car every single time. And it's amazing. And then if you're a little bit higher level, you probably have that person that works inside your company that you know, you won't be able to keep forever in that position. But if you funded them into something else, they would crush it. And so I think it's this secret of talent management and talent retention 
we used to think about it, like, how do I keep people in the company for a long time? And I think the 21st century way to do it is to think about how do I keep people in my ecosystem for a really long time? And if you can do that, then you can have people work for you for 20 years, but they can become owners too, right alongside you. And rule number 10, the last one before some very special bonus clips, is build your own path. You create your own meaning. We were meant to be creators. So I don't think you should wait for your purpose. I think you need to make it. That's where all the happiness is, is the intersection of the things that you like and the things that make money. You have to be the architect of your own life. The biggest mistake you can make is let somebody else write your story. And that's what most of us do. Most of us actually let other people tell us how our life should be structured. Here's what I think you should do to make sure that you don't screw up on this. Check out this tweet in particular. Every Sunday I sit myself down in a chair just like this and I ask myself a series of questions to make sure that I'm on the path that I want, not somebody else's. Some of the questions are things like, how much of this week did you enjoy? What percentage of the tasks that you had to do were things that you wanted to do? How happy or tired did you feel at the end of the day? Those small things multiply. How do people buy businesses for zero dollars and make them hundreds of thousands of dollars? Well, this business was a 12 year old website. And the strategy that I use to buy this business is one that I use again and again and again. That has four steps. I call it the four rules for business buy with zero dollars down. So the strategy is called South. Well, South. And there's four simple steps to it. Here's step number one. Day of. Laundromat. Laundromat business. Car washes. Car washes. What does this mean? This is a business that hasn't changed much. This is a business that uses fax machines. It uses hardline phones. Yo. What's up? A business that hasn't used technology and wouldn't even know what to do with two letters like AI. These businesses are all around. The business I bought is called Approachment. This business was in existence since the early 2000s. And the owner of this business was 65 years old. He hadn't changed a single thing on the website in 12 years. Years. It was full of stock images that basically make you unsure what the business does overall. Boring. Oh. The business does two things. It pairs offshore talent that answer responses to businesses with technology that allows businesses to respond 24-7 almost immediately to any lead. As it turns out, if they don't respond, they don't get clients. So I bought this step one stale business and I did it from an owner because he hadn't changed much over 12 years. Hasn't changed a bit. Step two, old. The oldest restaurant. The oldest winery. Oldest company. This was an old business. The owner of this business had been in multiple businesses for many years. He ran this company approachment. He ran a contracting company. He also had some construction company interests. The reason I like old businesses is because they have something called the Lindy effect, which basically means the longer something has been in existence, the more likely it is it will continue to be in existence. So this business has been around for 12 years, which actually means it's more reasonable that it'll be around for the next 12 years. A startup that's only been around for six months, probably not going to have a very good score based on the Lindy effect. Except most people think that because businesses are old, they're worthless. Well, that's where you're wrong and you can buy a business at much of a discount because most people assume that it ain't very good and it's not going to go very far. Now, the company Approachment, I actually reached out to because I was a user of their services. I used their chat. I love it. it increased my business's revenue a ton by never once missing a response to my customers. And so I asked him, how's it going? I said to the owner, are you still interested in running this business? It seems like retirement is like on the horizon for you. What are you thinking? And he agreed. So I look for businesses that are old. If you are a startup, I'm a no. If you're a hope and dream and not profitable, I'm a no thank you. If you have proprietary in the word, no way. All right, step three. Week. Competition. 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 What is this? Thing? I want a business that doesn't have really good competition. I would never buy an AI business right now. Why? I'm competing with OpenAI and Google and Microsoft. Who knows? Who else? With billions and billions and billions of dollars going after them. When I'm competing against my landscaping companies, my roofing companies, my car washes, my laundromats. Do you think any of the other competitors in the space are ones to be feared? The answer? No, you're looking for companies that don't even use text automation. You're looking for companies that have never focused on marketing or social media. Their competition is weak and you are going to provide the antithesis to weak. You're going to build a real business on top of a boring business. Step four, 
simple. This is incredibly important and probably where people mess up the most. They hear words like biotechnology and they instantly think the business is worth more. They hear words like proprietary and they want to start investing. We want a stupid, simple business. And the reason why is because we want to be able to understand tiny little levers that we can use to change a business. That's why any of these 150 businesses I would invest in. Let me tell you a few that aren't so simple. Biotechnology, no, AI technology. Probably not. Anything patent pending, I'm gonna be a no. You want me to invest in the next hot startup or something with the word algorithm in it? Also, probably no. These are businesses that are so simple, like inserting a coin into a washer or dryer, having said washer or dryer run, and then finally taking the profit out of it. Boring businesses often equal billions. Do you think it's uh, necessary to take that pain early? Or if in a in an alternative or in an alternate universe, could you have enjoyed that process while also getting all the benefits from it? That's a good question. Like, uh, I, I think I did enjoy the process. Mm. I think I learned to love pain and struggle. Okay. And, uh, and there were da- the only thing that was the hard for me is being really, really tired. Mm-hmm. I can see that why that's a torture tactic because there were days where you had to focus and I would be like, wah, 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 wah. you know, I'm like, I'm barely here right now. Um, that was really tough. But actually the long hours working on an interesting problem set is, is not a problem. But I think it is a, and I was just thinking about this this week. I had a tough week this week, stuff going on in the companies, lots of work, no sleeping. And, um, And I was writing about reminding myself, why do I keep doing this? Hmm. I don't technically need to keep doing this. You probably don't technically need to keep doing this. So why? And the reason is because I think that the struggle is a bit of an honor. And I think if you want to know what the key to happiness is, it's struggle. If you want to know what the key to wealth is, it's struggle. If you want to know what the, the key to making a lot of money is, it's struggle. And the more that you can realize that iron actually does sharpen iron, and the more sort of difficult things you can champion and do, the more likely you are to have a successful life. Um, I I think it's a life hack. It's a secret that these days we don't want to hear. Now everybody wants, you know, I want to do the least and make the most. Mm. I want to hire the least amount of people and have the biggest company. I'm a solo entrepreneur that will never employ anybody that makes millions on the internet. And you can do it too without any work and four hours a week. Like that's the thing that we've said we want. And then I think about it for a second. I stand back and I'm like, is that really what we want? Like what happened to building empires? What happened to leaving legacies? What are you going to do in the other 52 hours of your week? And so I don't think you have to struggle forever, but I think periods of struggle make the periods of relaxation really poignant. And with one without the other is like a day without a night. Nobody wants to live in a complete pleasure and happiness always Mm. because it diminishes. And so I do think you need it. I'm not sure you deserve the right to be an owner if you can't have difficult conversations. And so I think a little bit of this is having a conversation with yourself and saying, am I the type of human who wants to lead people, who wants to be an owner, who wants to leave a mark on this world? And if so, there are a few things that I have to add to my tool belt through life. And one of them is that I have to release people when they are not a fit for my company and when I am not a fit for them. And the second that you realize that, one, it's always worse than you think. It's always it's always better than you think it's going to be. Very seldom have I ever fired somebody where they've, one, been surprised or two, it's gone badly. And that's because it's really important to your point about managing them out. And this stuff is kind of tactical and people who don't lead teams or run businesses don't love talking about this actually at all. But it's really important that you have check-ins early and you get comfortable with friction. So I'm always telling my managers, like, stop giving compliments to people on your team that are underperforming just because it makes you feel better. Like you have to have the tough conversation. How terrible would it be if you were riding, learning to ride a bike and every time you fell over, your parents were just like, yeah, just keep doing that. That, yeah, didn't work. But like you should keep doing exactly that way where you keep leaning all the way over to the left. They're never going to learn to ride the bike. And so as a good leader, you have to be able to say, hey, man, like your sales numbers are down. You're not making enough phone calls. Do you want me to listen in to what's going on there? And to actually give people feedback. And then people won't be surprised when something happens because you will have been coaching them in and up or out for a period of time already. I remember when I went to go ask for my raise, I was like, what is a way where I could decrease this sucking for him because it's awful when somebody asks you for a raise as an employee and you can't give it to them or you don't think they're as an employer or you don't think that they're actually 
yeah. worth that. Um, and so there's this tension, obviously, that happens immediately. And everybody all the time is coming to you as an employer asking yeah. for more, more, more money. And so you can actually really negatively impact the, the relationship. But I said, okay, I'm going to come up with like kind of a fun way that I could ask him where he is never going to have felt this before and simultaneously will feel like it's low risk. So I like search around on the internet and I kind of found this idea of I got a cocktail napkin and on the cocktail napkin I wrote on it uh, like a couple numbers. Like the first number was uh, the growth that I was going to have in the business. I think it was from a revenue perspective. Like the second number was what our profits were going to be in the business that I was the, I was working in in my little lane. Uh, and then the third was what I wanted. And I pulled the napkin out in a meeting with Andy and I'm all sweaty and I'm nervous and I um, said, you know, Andy, somewhere I read that... Um, any idea worth having at some point was written on a cocktail napkin. And so I said, I uh, want to earn more money at this company, but I fully understand that in order to earn more money, I have to make more money for the company. So I brought you an idea for what I think I could increase and grow within the company that would be really material to you. And if I did those things, maybe I could make this number at the bottom. And if that number isn't right for you, I'd love to have a conversation on what it would take for me to get to that bottom number and we could adjust the top ones. And he kind of like looked at me, he's like, that. Like what's wrong with, you know, it's, it's just like defused the situation. Yeah. And so as an employee, those little negotiation tactics, I did them at least once a year. And sometimes I did them biannually if I was really killing it, um, led me to being one of the better paid people pretty consistently. Um, and then I always usually asked for any ability to co-invest in deals we were doing. So it was like, I'm going to put my money, I believe in what we're doing so much here. I'd like to put my money into a deal. I'm not asking you for anything. I'm asking for you to like, maybe let me put 5k in and that led to me accelerating my my cash That's faster cool. when i was younger i think i had a lot of stories about um you know why I needed my dad for a lot of things, for instance, in a positive way, like in an incredibly positive way. But that led me to bad partnerships. Like I knew no, that I, I had I to that. redo partnerships and totally learn how to partner up with somebody. And I think a lot of people, this is one of the things that I obsess on with humans is, and you know this very well, but I obsess on humans choosing the right partners to go through life with from a business perspective. Yeah. I don't know about marriage and otherwise I've done oh well, you know, well thus far, ho hopefully. But um, but when it comes to businesses, I see so so many humans partner with whoever's in front of them, not set the terms, not oh, start so, with the end in mind, God. not write a prenup to their yeah. business. And what people don't realize, if you go to venture capitalists and you ask them what are some of their top three things, while they'll, why they would invest in a business or another, one of the very first things is they want co-founders. Why? That doesn't seem like a great idea to me. Most people get divorced because they make them set parameters for the divorce that could potentially happen, and they know that entrepreneurship is so hard, it's likely one of them will fail or want to be done, but the other one won't. And so if you think about that in every business venture that you do, you've partnered with a ton of people. You know partnership is really, really powerful, but it's really hard. And yeah. so the past experience of me thinking that I needed my dad everywhere led me to partner with other men that I immediately thought were as great as he was. And then realized, oh, not everybody's my dad. I've got to be a little bit tighter. I've got to be a little bit more thoughtful yeah, on partnerships. Yeah, yeah. If you sit next to an, uh, a high performer, yeah. So if you have your team sit next to a high performer, you do, you will outperform by 15%. So a high performer just in your proximity will increase your performance by 15%. If you sit next to a low performer or underperformer, it will decrease your productivity by 30%. So every B player you bring on board is not just decreasing their productivity by 30%. It is that energy transfer, which is that everybody around them becomes a little bit less productive. And I think one of the reasons people want to be owners of companies is because they feel that. People want to stay at companies where there's a bunch of winners. That's why I liked Goldman. I was like, these guys are so smart. I'm learning so much. I want to keep going. When I was at Vanguard, I was like, oh my God, these schleps are just schlepping around the office, not doing anything. I'm not learning anything. And they're by you know, design sort of pulling you back and down. And so I, I keep that number on a notepad next to my computer for me to one, not be the underperformer, and two, it's not just about getting rid of underperformers for you as a CEO. It's not good to do to your team. So, you know, we've definitely have, have had them in varying companies of mine, but we push relentlessly to either make people better or help them find the thing that they can be an A performer at.
All right, so what's an operator? It's the thing that allows me to own 26 businesses that are all cash flowing as I'm talking to you. Tell me more. It's the thing that allows Buffett to find time for that McDonald's every morning. It's also the thing that could allow you to save small business owners from closing their doors forever. You're the bridge to the future. So Warren Buffett realized this, wanted to be a billionaire. He realized he needed an operator. Enter Charlie Munger. Warren and Charlie both became billionaires through Warren finding the deals and Charlie operating them. Then Charlie hired a bunch of people just like him. And instead of doing what most bosses do, which is micromanage, he lived by this quote, when you buy a dog, you don't do the barking for it. Small words, really impactful. When you hire an operator, you don't do the operating for them. We help find you your operating bulldog. And it's probably not how you think. Let's find these people. We got a case study first. This is Miss Nevada Does Mail, I call it. All right, my friend Lisa scaled her mini mailbox business while running three other companies. Do you think she licks the stamps herself and slaps them on the boxes day in and day out? Not on those heels, she doesn't. Because Lisa understands the upside of having operators that could manage her business while she's working. She hired cocktail waitresses off the Vegas Strip. Brilliant. Look at these ladies. You don't get to be in the service industry for long if you aren't a quick learner and a natural hustler. Also, you age out. Also, if you do this, no one slaps your ass at the mail store. Get started. <laughs> that one hiring decision to take waitresses and turn them into owners and operators has made her more than $250,000 a year. You are putting a lot of effort into social media. I am putting a lot of effort into social media. No. Why, are, why are you doing it? What's the point of growing this is this just ego is it you know because there's, there's probably a little bit that definitely drives me but like yeah. why like why do you do it i started it uh in 2020 for a couple different reasons one was i got a little bored because i wasn't doing road shows and private equity like i was for mm -hmm. the past like 15 years running around every week you know the deal yeah. raising money from investors vetting deals i was working like 60 70 80 hour weeks and when COVID happened i had a little bit of time and i actually got to take a step back and think for a minute and in that period, I was trying to think about uh, leverage. So basically, what is the highest leverage activity for my time that I could spend in this moment? And for most of my career, I hadn't thought that way. I had really sort of thought, what's the next step in my career? And then the next step. But there's a power play to determining how you want to spend your time. And if you can actually think, okay, what is the, you know, as Archimedes said, give me a, a fulcrum and a lever, give me a fulcrum and a lever to place upon it. And, uh, and uh, if you have a long enough version, you can move the world, right? And so I kind of thought about that with social media. And I think I read a post from Naval Ravikant that basically talked about the three levels of leverage, which was first employment uh, or people. You know, you could do something bigger than yourself if you convinced other people to join you. And then the second lever was capital. Most of the big wealthy humans that we know through time as titans, like the Rockefellers and the Rothschilds were created during the Banking Act, right? When we got access to other people's capital at scale. And then the third was code. Bezos, Musk, um, Gates, all of these guys had early access to technology before other people did, and so they had an army of robots, quote unquote, online. And the fourth one that he hadn't talked about enough yet was audience. And audience, in my mind, is the first permissionless form of leverage. Banks, you had to ask for the money. Code, you had to have access to the technology. And for humans, you needed money to mm -hmm. pay them, right? And now we had audience. And I thought, wait a second, I'm running around trying to raise capital for investment deals. I'm doing, you know, I'm in the million mile club. I'm doing 100,000 plus miles uh, a year. Um, it's actually not that fun. <laughs> what would it look like if instead of me going to people, I brought them to me? And once I started looking at the power of social media, I thought, oh my, this is, I can't believe I haven't seen this before. In finance, we don't typically do social media because unlike real estate, we have way tighter rules yeah. for, for raising capital. And so um, I remember I worked at a firm where I was, had all these licenses, you know, 66 and 63 and series seven and 24. And um, my my firm said, you know, if, if you say anything publicly, you could move the markets. I'm like, bro, it's like me and my mom on here. Yeah. Nobody's following my <laughs> stuff yet. Um, but they basically, you know, my CEO at the time said to me, we get rich quietly. Um, you know, we, we get rich quietly and we don't talk about it. We don't make a ruckus. And I thought, I don't know. I think we could like get rich in public if we did it the right way. And so that convinced me, oh, I'm going to build a huge social audience. I'm going to never do another steak dinner and I'm going to see how big this could get. And it turns out it's, I was right. If you speak the language of money, you usually make more of it. Man, this one is so true. There's a bunch of words they use in finance that take people from really, really rich to outside of the loop entirely. 
Most of us don't speak the language of finance, and I think that's on purpose. I think people in finance do not want you to know the secrets to wealth, because that makes it easier for them to keep it. But there are so many terms, EBITDA, ROI, cash on cash return, expense ratio, the list goes on and on and on. Actually, there's a whole article here on it if you want it. But if you actually want to get real wealth, you have to learn the main terms. It's pretty easy to do, actually. You could take a couple courses on YouTube. But this was actually told to me by one of the wealthiest partners uh, at Goldman Sachs. They came down in the beginning and did a little lunch and learn with us when I was at the firm. And we were asking a bunch of questions and he was using jargon, EBITDA, for instance. And I remember one of the people in the room raised their hands and they said, what does the term EBITDA mean? Can you explain that? And he kind of looked at the person with like snooty Goldman air as we did and said, I don't know how you got a job at this firm without speaking the language of money. That term exactly, the language of money. And he said, you go find the answer to that. I'm not here to be your dictionary. And it was such a perfectly Goldman response, but actually he was right. So it always stuck with me. Learn the terms, then you can make the cash. The people who love you, they want what's best for them typically, which is that you're safe, you're secure, everything's okay. They don't really want what's quote unquote best for you because that's actually the scary thing. Real growth happens when you take huge risks and you potentially fail and you realize that you're not going to die. And so I realized that my loved ones were some of the reasons that were actually holding me back. Um, super supportive, but they were always saying things like, is the grass always greener, Cody? You know, what about this next thing? Is that really going to make you happy? You know, are you sure it's not you? Is it them? And in some cases, they're right. I just have that, that ridiculous urge to keep growing and doing more. But that, that made me jump from one, two, three, four, five, five finance companies in like 10 years or something like that, because I thought it was each, it was the individual company. And I didn't realize, oh no, I'm just like unemployable. I want to work for myself. I'm not going to be great at being at somebody else's employee. Um, but it was the stories that I heard again and again from my family because they wanted to keep me safe. Very kind, but not right for me. Cody, do you have any final advice for someone who's listening who wants to get into the business of boring businesses? Twofold. One, I think you guys did a really good job of not making it sound too simplistic and easy. You know, you too can buy a business with zero dollars, spend zero time on it, become a millionaire, have a Lambo and a yacht. Like that's not what we're talking about here. And on the flip side of that, also assume that you as a human are much more capable than you're giving yourself credit for and assume that you've met a lot of business owners. How smart did you think all of them were? Have you been impressed by every business owner that you've engaged with? The answer is no. I've met a bunch of the big time business owners. And I can tell you what, 10% of the time I have blown away and 90% of the time I think I'm coming for you. And so for those listening, if it does sound like you are the type of human that wants to own a business, that wants to make the impact that I think is the most powerful impact any human can have, which is to build something, to employ others, and to create so other people can consume. I think there's no higher calling. And I think that buying businesses allows you to do it when you don't have that startup seed inside of you that you would die if you didn't build it, but instead just want to get in the game. And I think getting in the game is half the battle. Uh, and then you can figure out what game you want to play once you get there. Because you made it this far in a video, I want to celebrate you. Most people start and don't finish. Most people never actually follow through. Most people say they want something, but they don't ever do the work to actually get it. But you are different. You are special. Believe Nation, you made it here all the way to the end and I love you. So it's a special celebration if you put a hashtag believe down in the comments below on this video, I will showcase you and celebrate you somewhere on the screen in a future video because you are awesome. For 10 more amazing rules from Mel Robbins, check the video right there next to me. I think you'll love it. Continue to believe and I'll see you there. There's always a reason why you are doing something. And when you can find the reason or the purpose for why you want to either give that speech or destroy the sales uh, presentation or 